So I wanted to go ahead and end the course on the two assumptions that kind of got us thus far. One part of me wanted to go ahead and review the plugin principle, but I've already done a video on that. So if you are a little bit hesitant, if you're not completely convinced of the plugin principle, do check it out because that's the principle that's gotten us all the way here. Okay, so let's go back and talk about the very beginning. So we would have a population in the beginning, a population of interest. In order to study this population, some parameter of interest from this population, we take a sample of size n and we take one single sample from it. So this sample would be pretty useful. We could use this sample in order to study good estimates for things of the population, for parameters of interest in the population, like the average IQ. But if we were interested in doing more than just giving a single point as an estimate, like making a confidence interval, we would need to take samples from the sample. So in this case, our samples would again be of size n, but we take lots more of them. We take, in this case, n more samples. Finally, we get the bootstrap samples. And these bootstrap samples in the end are what I'm going to be plotting on the right. Okay, so let's talk about these two assumptions. The first assumption that I want to talk about is n, that n is big enough. So it's important to get a big enough sample in the first place. The reason why is because, well, the fundamental idea of the plug-in principle said that theta hat would be a good estimator for theta as n gets really, really big. So if n isn't necessarily big enough, then theta hat isn't going to be a good estimator for theta. But there's a second issue here. And that second issue deals with confidence intervals. So I'm going to be plotting the bootstrap sampling distribution, in this case, for a small n. For a small n, the bootstrap sampling distribution might look like this, very, very wide. To make a confidence interval from this, the confidence interval would also be incredibly wide. So it would be very, very big, a very large confidence interval. However, if n becomes very, very big instead of very, very small, our distribution becomes skinnier and we can get a smaller confidence interval. So in this case, we're more confident that the value is somewhere in the middle versus in the previous one where we had a small n, we weren't really confident where it was. It could be a lot of places. Now, we have one more assumption and that is that our n, our capital N is big enough too. So what can happen if the capital N is too small? So once again, let's plot a too small capital N. So a too small capital N might look a little bit blocky. You might see some drop offs at different points. It doesn't look as smooth. And the problem here is that this too small N is an approximate distribution. And it's very approximate because we didn't take enough samples. This means taking probability or chance wise interpretations of this distribution is pretty dangerous because we just don't have enough samples. So instead, oh, whoopsie daisies. So instead, if we get enough n, so if we get capital N to be big enough, we had a nice smooth distribution that we're comfortable taking good confidence intervals from. So we're comfortable taking the probabilistic interpretations of these. So once again, we have these two assumptions. First is that the n, the sample size initially over here, is big enough. Now this is important for confidence intervals and it's also important for the point estimates. And the second thing is that this capital N is big enough. And this is incredibly important for the confidence intervals themselves. And this capital N comes from here. I'm going to be discussing what would be good sizes for both N and capital N a little bit later on. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned, though those talks will be quite technical. So if you've reached here, this is about as intuitive as it's going to get. Uh, after this, we're going to be doing examples, which will help practitioners. So necessarily, if you're going to be doing confidence intervals on a daily basis, then you'll definitely want to see some of these examples and it will give you much more intuition on how to use bootstrap confidence intervals. And then finally, we're going to be talking about much more theoretical points, points that aren't as intuitive, but that are important if you're going to be a practitioner. So I would say if you're watching these videos out of idle curiosity, this is a good point to, to stop and it's a good point uh, that will allow you to communicate with data scientists and other people to make data driven decisions. However, if you're watching this as a practitioner, I would very much so urge you to continue on.